Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Today, I'm dedicating this video to my mom because she spent countless hours playing the Pokemon trading card game with me, as well as just indulging my constant conversations about these little imaginary creatures. Thanks so much for being so patient with me, mom. Little did you know, you were training me for my career, so I really appreciate it. Because of the occasion, I felt it was time to revisit Kangaskhan. I did this one a long time ago in my Safari Showdown, where I put this beast up against Tauros. Now, I'm sure you're saying, but Scott, Tauros' stats are just way better. Well, yeah, that is true, but it is also a slow growth rate Pokemon, and in the end, Kangaskhan ended up coming out on top. In order to not repeat my previous video, today we're going to compare how Kangaskhan solos Pokemon Yellow version and Pokemon Red version. Typically, I assume that Yellow version is going to be significantly harder for Pokemon. After all, in the mid game, many gym leaders got level increases, as well as they got better Pokemon on their team, like specifically Blaine. Also, the movesets during the league are just far superior in this game. However, one thing that I infrequently mention is the fact that Brock's Pokemon are two levels higher in Pokemon Red and Blue, and for a normal type that starts with only normal type moves, this could be quite the problem. Through level up, Kangaskhan stays with only normal type moves. Remember that in generation 1, Bite is a normal type move. Plus, I really don't want to level up to level 26 to be able to defeat Brock, so I'm going to have to be able to do it with just Comet Punch and Rage. Now, luckily, Kangaskhan does get the same type of attack bonus with both of these moves. However, it still isn't going to be enough to face the first gym leader on minimum battles. So I'm going to have to train in the forest, defeating the bug catchers here. While I do that, let's examine the mechanics of the two moves that I have access to for this first pivotal battle. Comet Punch is a multi-hit move. It has 18 power, 85% accuracy, and 15 PP. Remember that it only deducts 1 PP and then hits multiple times. As a normal type move, this is fantastic against Brock because then every turn, on minimum, I am dealing somewhere between 2 and 5 damage. However, Kangaskhan has decent attack and stab, so I figure that I should be doing at least 2 damage per hit, which makes the damage range somewhere between 4 and 10, which is great. Now in Generation 1, with multi-hit moves, when the first strike gets a critical hit, all of the rest will also do the same amount of damage. So that can really help to clear the Geodude at the beginning of a fight as fast as possible. Additionally, when the Onyx is using Bide, the damage accumulated only counts the first hit. So if I get a 5 hit, then that's a lot of free damage that isn't going to be paid back to Kangaskhan. Okay, so that's it for Comet Punch, now let's talk about Rage. As a kid, this was one of the moves that frustrated me the most. I distinctly remember an experience where my friend and I were playing Pokemon Yellow in the backseat of my van while my mom was driving us home from the mountains. And he got locked into a battle where he selected Rage with his Onyx against an opponent Onyx. And once you select Rage, you cannot do anything else in the battle. You can't enter your inventory, you can't switch Pokemon, you can't run from the battle. All you have to do is continue using Rage until either your Pokemon faints or the opponent Pokemon faints. My friend lacked the same level of obsession with Pokemon that I had, so it ended up being the case that he just got frustrated, was like, I'm gonna turn off my game and I was like, no, 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 don't do that. We are going to beat this Onyx. So I took his Game Boy, and for the rest of the trip home, I just sat there mashing A until eventually the opponent Onyx was defeated. He ended up losing interest in the series, so I bought his Pokemon Yellow cartridge off of him so that I could trade with myself to evolve certain Pokemon, get multiple fossils, that sort of thing. However, Rage isn't all frustration, because when the opponent hits you and does damage, it raises your attack stat by one stage. This is how it works in Generation 1. In Generation 2, it was turned into a Rage counter that does not affect your attack stat, but in Generation 1, it is boosting your attack. This does mean that later on in the game, this move can be used to badge boost, but I really hope that it's not going to come to that. Kangaskhan has access to a lot of other great coverage moves that I think will be much better to use instead of Rage. I think it's also worth noting here that Rage only deducts 1 PP, and then you're locked into it, and it doesn't deduct any more PP throughout the rest of the fight. So there's actually no way to deplete this move and then start using something else. Pick a Spray has talked about this in one of his soft lock videos where he got soft locked against Lorelei, so check that video out if you haven't already seen it. Okay, so let's catch up now with where my Pokemon Yellow playthrough is. I'm just defeating the junior trainer in Brock's gym, and as a medium fast growth rate Pokemon, this means I've only reached level 10. 
This is over a damage rounding threshold, so I think that it makes sense to face Brock at this level. After all, his Geodude is level 10, and his Onyx is only level 12 in Pokemon Yellow. So, let's give it a try. Now, the consequence of his Geodude being two levels lower means that it doesn't know Defense Curl. As a result, this thing is going to spam Tackle every single turn, and so I figured that starting with Rage actually made a lot of sense. This way, I can boost my attack stat to plus 6 before the Onyx comes out, and then do maximum damage against it. However, at this low of a level, the Geodude is doing a lot of damage to Kangaskhan, and as a result, by the time Onyx comes out, I only have half of my HP remaining. Now, here's an interesting Generation 1 interaction. When I get a critical hit, it bypasses my stage modifiers, even beneficial ones, and as a result, I only do 2 damage to the Onyx with Rage. On the next turn though, I don't get a critical hit, and now I'm doing significantly more damage. Alright, so now let's talk about another disadvantage of starting with Rage right away on the Geodude. And that's that if Onyx is using Bide, then I do a lot of damage to it, and when it eventually unleashes energy, it deals so much back to Kangaskhan and knocks me out. So, that's my first reset. Okay, so let's switch up my strategy. What if I use Comet Punch to knock out the Geodude, and then I use Rage later on in the fight against Onyx? I was thinking that this would be very beneficial because using Comet Punch against an Onyx that is using Bide is going to be a much more favorable situation for me. Also, Comet Punch can just miss, and then Onyx accumulates no damage during those turns. However, Comet Punch is doing very little damage to Onyx, so eventually I decide to go for Rage, and unfortunately for me, there isn't really a winning scenario here because my attack stat is so low, I am dealing minimal damage to the Onyx, I don't have the health remaining to set up, and as a result I take my second reset. Okay, so it appears that Kangaskhan should not be facing Brock at level 10, so I'm going to go up to level 13, the next damage rounding threshold, and then attempt again. Now, during this fight, I'm just going to bring up Kangaskhan's base stats, because I think it makes sense to go through them now. So Kangaskhan has 105 HP, 95 attack, 80 defense, 40 special, and 90 speed, giving it a 17.58% chance to crit. Leveling up to level 13 really benefits Kangaskhan because it gives it a lot more HP because it has a fantastic base HP stat. This is one of the main things I remember about it from my Tauros vs Kangaskhan video. It just felt like this thing was always ready to take a hit, whereas Tauros wasn't. So with my improved HP stat, I decided to go for Rage right away, and this looks like it is a good choice. The Geodude isn't doing much to me, so by the time I knock it out, I have green health left over for the Onyx. Okay, so now I just need to hope that it is not going to use Bide too much during this fight, because I think that if it went for it every time it could choose a move, I would probably get KO'd. I take it down under half health, and then it goes for Bide. My Rage gets a crit, meaning it does less damage, which is perfect. Then my next Rage gets another critical hit, alright. And then my final Rage gets a third critical hit. And as a result, Onyx unleashes energy, not doing very much, and I am finally able to defeat Brock. So in yellow version, Kangaskhan clocks in with a first split of 9 minutes and 56 seconds. So now, it's time to switch over to Pokemon Red, and see how Kangaskhan is going to do in this game when Brock's Pokemon are two levels higher. However, there are other subtle factors that Kangaskhan is competing with here, not just Brock. First of all, when I defeat the Squirtle in the lab, it gives less experience than the Eevee does in Pokemon Yellow. And then, on Route 1, as well as in Viridian Forest, the Pokemon here are at lower levels, meaning their experience yields are going to be worse. As a result, I am going to level up slower. Also, the bug catchers in the forest have Weedles on their team, meaning Poison Sting can poison you, and that results in the need for item usage, as well as more frequent trips to the Pokemon Center. In this case, I actually have to backtrack all the way to Viridian City in order to heal my Kangaskhan before I continue my training. Now there's another difference in Brock's gym as well that could be challenging for Kangaskhan, and that's the Junior Trainer's team. In Pokemon Yellow, his Diglett is level 9, and his Sandshrew is also level 9, but in Pokemon Red and Blue, these Pokemon are both given the 2 level increase to level 11. I figured the developers lower their levels in yellow version so that Pikachu would have an easier time with them, and this came with a consequence. The Sandshrew loses Sand Attack in yellow version, but it has Sand Attack in Pokemon Red and Blue. Because 
I have to knock it out with either Rage or Comet Punch. This means it's going to have the chance to set up with Sand Attack, lowering my accuracy, and it goes for this move first turn, but luckily it fails. It hits on the next turn, I miss a Comet Punch, which is really annoying because now this move's accuracy is 56%. Luckily for me though, things don't spiral out of control, I hit my Comet Punch, and Sandshrew goes down, leveling Kangaskhan up to level 10. However, I know that this level doesn't work in yellow version, so it's definitely not going to be enough in red version. So I head back to Viridian Forest and start doing my training. Now, this is actually a mistake. I shouldn't be training in the forest. I should just be training south of Pewter City. The experience yields are better here than in the forest in Pokemon Red, whereas in Pokemon Yellow, the experience yields are better in the forest because you can run into rare encounters like the Pidgeotto, which is level 9, and it gives a lot of experience. Just because Brock is at two levels higher, I'm also going to take my Kangaskhan up two levels higher than it was in yellow version. So once I reach level 15, I head over to the gym, and now in Pokemon Red, it is time for our first gym battle. Right away, there's a difference in this battle. Geodude is two levels higher, also its sprite is much worse. I hate this red and blue sprite, by the way. Like, what is going on with Geodude's forehead? And also, its arm on the right-hand side looks like some kind of strange noodle. Ah, <laughs> uh, just terrible. Anyways, this Geodude being two levels higher knows Defense Curl. As a result, it can really cut the damage from Comet Punch, and if I choose to use Rage, then there is a chance that it is not going to boost my attack stat every turn. In in this fight, I decided to go for a hybrid approach, so I'm going to use Comet Punch to knock the Geodude down to low-ish health, and then I switch into Rage to hopefully get a little bit set up before the Onyx comes out. I managed to get plus two before I defeat the Geodude, and now I'm moving on to Brock's Ace with green health remaining. Here's the thing, in red and blue, this Pokemon only has three moves, which actually is a bad thing for Kangaskhan, because it means that Onyx is going to choose Bide more frequently. On the first two turns that it has a choice between which move it's going to use, it chooses Bide both times, and even at level 15, I do not have enough health to sustain the damage that it unleashes, and as a result, red version gets its first reset here. However, here's the thing, the next damage rounding threshold is level 18, which is going to take way too long, and I think what needs to happen here anyways is for the Onyx just to not chain Bide over and over and over again. When that doesn't happen, Rage is enough, and I'm able to defeat it on my second attempt. So in red version, Kangaskhan is significantly slower, earning itself a 13 minute and 33 second Brock split. The question that's on my mind now is will it be able to gain back significant time throughout the rest of the game? I'm assuming that it will be able to claw back at least a little bit of time during the mid game. Now just in case you are new to my videos and you're unaware of my current format, here's how it works. I'll do this first playthrough with both of the Pokemon to collect some preliminary data, as well as to figure out which spots in the playthrough are most tricky and need optimizing. Then I'll use a bunch of software tools that I've developed in collaboration with a bunch of other amazing people in the community, and we will hopefully come up with a more definitive run for Kangaskhan in both yellow and red. After that, I will play this more definitive route, collecting more data, and we will do a final comparison. Of course, I'm following rules for each of these playthroughs, and those are listed in the description. In short, I can only use my starter in battle, I can't use any items in battle, I'm not allowed to use any overworld glitches or save states, and I also can't use evasion boosting moves until I hit level 100. Okay, so with all that in mind, let's move on to Mount Moon. Here, Kangaskhan gets access to its first coverage move in the form of Water Gun. Now, its special stat is almost half what its physical attack is, so this move is really only going to be useful against Pokemon like Geodude when it does four times damage. However, let's take the time now to go through the other coverage moves that Kangaskhan gets access to. It can learn Bubble Beam, Ice Beam, Blizzard, which has 90% accuracy in Generation 1. It has a 10% chance to freeze, by the way. Only in the Japanese copies of the game does it have a 30% chance to freeze. Kangaskhan also gets access to Thunderbolt, Thunder, Earthquake, Fire Blast, Rock Slide, and Surf. Additionally, it's also going to get access to both Mega Punch and Body Slam, which are fantastic same type attack bonus moves. However, what isn't so fantastic for it in Pokemon Red is the fact that I'm going to have to catch HM users, which in yellow version are mostly going to be provided to me for free throughout the rest of the playthrough. By the way, I am nicknaming all of these HM users after people who support me through YouTube memberships at the Venomoth tier, so thank you so much. Of course, in the next section of the cave, I pick up the TM for Mega Punch and teach this immediately 
immediately to Kangaskhan in the place of rage. After that, I grab the dome fossil, and then I head towards Cerulean City. By the way, there is no Jesse and James fight here in Pokemon Red. There is another Rocket earlier in the cave who only has two Pokemon, so that's a small time advantage for Pokemon Red here, but it basically cancels out with the fact that I had to catch a Paris. In the Cerulean section of the game, I always have to make a choice, and here I decided to go for Misty right away. Up first is Staryu. Unfortunately, Mega Punch has 85% accuracy, so I end up missing. Misty sets up an X Defend. By the way, my overlay was not calculating the opponent's boosts at this point when I filmed these playthroughs, so that's why you're not seeing it on the right hand side of the screen. Because of the defense boost, I don't knock the Staryu out in one hit, so I sustain a tiny bit of damage before I move on to the Starmie. Unfortunately, it's faster than me, gets a crit with Bubble Beam, and takes Kangaskhan all the way down to 11 hit points. I use Mega Punch, it does more than half because of a critical hit, and then Starmie uses Water Gun, finishing me off. Okay, so I don't think I'll lose there if the Starmie doesn't get a critical hit with Bubble Beam, so I'm going to try the fight again. However, if Misty boosts Starmie's defense with X Defend on the first turn, then my Mega Punch takes 4 hits to knock it out, and in combination with a critical hit, Kangaskhan goes down again. Okay, so I'm gonna fight the Swimmer in Misty's gym. His Pokemon actually have decent experience yields, and this gets me much closer to level 20. This way, once I knock the Staryu out, then my Kangaskhan is gonna level up over a damage rounding threshold, and then I will do more damage to the Starmie. This time, turn one, it goes for Water Gun, Mega Punch hits, getting a critical hit, taking her ace all the way down to red health. While it does get another attack in, it's not enough. My Mega Punch hits, and with that, I've earned myself the second badge. My split clocks in at 19 minutes and 37 seconds. Although I do expect this will be a time loss in comparison with yellow version, just because I had two resets here. However, the prize for winning this badge is Bubble Beam, and I really wanted this move before I fought all of the trainers on Nugget Bridge, just to make them much faster. And now it's time to face the rival. So in red and blue version, I think he's slightly harder because he leads with Pidgeotto, which is quite chunky, and it also has Sand Attack. Luckily, it doesn't go for it against me, and I'm able to knock it out without my accuracy being lowered. Of course the next Pokemon is Abra, it's basically a free knockout because the only move it has is Teleport which has no effect in trainer battles. Rattata is the same between the games, I outspeed and knock it out with one Mega Punch, and now I'm moving on to his Squirtle. This is the second reason that this fight is going to be harder for Kangaskhan, just because it has special moves in the form of Bubble and Water Gun, whereas the Eevee and Yellow version is only going to have physical attacks. However, since the rest of the fight went so well I'm not worried, and in this case, Mega Mega Punch actually gets the one hit on Squirtle. Okay, so it's time to take care of the rest of Nugget Bridge. There is a small time savings in red version at the end of this area because you can use the escape rope to teleport back to Cerulean City. This was patched out in yellow version, so I'm going to lose 5 seconds there. Next, I take on the rocket outside of the city, and unfortunately for Kangaskhan, despite the fact that it was rumored to maybe be Marowak's evolution, and the fact that it learns both Earthquake and Fissure, it cannot learn Dig, so I have to proceed with the same moveset to face Sandy. What I'm hoping here is that I'm going to one-hit her Pidgeys with Mega Punch, and I am, and now I just have to hope that I won't miss. And in this case, I do on the third one, however it just goes for Quick Attack, and I end up finishing it off. Alright, so now it is time for a major moveset upgrade, because on the SSN I can defeat this optional youngster, and then grab the TM for Body Slam. Obviously I'm going to teach this right away in the place of Bide. You might have wondered why I had it on my set in the first place, it was just in case I needed to bypass accuracy checks in any of the early battles. I grab the rare candy, go up against the rival on the SSN. Here he is once again better in red version. This is specifically because he has a Kadabra with confusion, and his starter has also evolved. However, because I have Body Slam, this fight is not going to be a problem for Kangaskhan in either version. And with that out of the way, let's head into Surge's gym to take on the third gym leader. Alright, this is another disadvantage for the red version Kangaskhan, because Surge has three Pokemon, so that just means it's going to take longer. However, because he has three Pokemon, they're at lower levels, and that means that Kangaskhan has more speed than all of his Pokemon. Yes, even the Raichu. And as a result, I sweep through his team with a series of three one-hits. Once again, another underwhelming performance for Lieutenant Surge. Coming out of this battle in Pokemon Red, I have a time of 26 minutes and 46 seconds. So now let's see if the yellow Kangaskhan can maintain the time lead, which is 3 minutes and 30 seconds, that it got from Brock. As I mentioned before, there are essentially no differences for Kangaskhan here until the end of Mount Moon where I have to face Jesse and James. However, this is a very small difference because Kangaskhan isn't worried about any of their team members. I make the same choice in yellow version as I did in red and blue to go up against Misty first.
Going into this fight, you're going to notice that my Kangaskhan is at a lower level than I was in Pokemon Red, and that is just because I did less training against optional trainers in Mount Moon. In these videos, I like to report what I did, and honestly, thinking back to these two playthroughs, I am not sure why I made this choice. Misty is essentially the same between the two games. The only difference is the fact that the Starmie has Harden, which it doesn't have in Pokemon Red. This makes it slightly less likely to use its powerful water type moves, so I guess she is a bit easier in yellow version. You can see that here in this fight when the Starmie at low red health goes for Harden instead of trying to attack me, like it could have knocked me out with Bubble Beam. As a result, Kangaskhan is able to take a first attempt victory here. Okay, so now it's time for the rival on Nugget Bridge, and here's why he's significantly easier in yellow version. Because he doesn't lead with Pidgeotto, he can't set up Sand Attack right away. His second Pokemon is his Sand Attack user, which is Sandshrew. However, I have Bubble Beam for it. After that, I'm not really worried about any of his Pokemon, because Kangaskhan has good HP as well as good defense, and all of these Pokemon are physical attackers. So, I take a quick victory here. Okay, so now let's go into the rival battle on the SSN. Obviously, I have Body Slam here, so I'm not really worried about his team. Plus, he has no special attackers, so there's no threat to Kangaskhan at all. However, what I will note here is my choice to not train in Mount Moon has impacted in me being one level lower at the very end of this fight. So my speed is 64, and what that means is I am not going to move first against Surge's Raichu. What I'm most worried for here is that it's going to get a critical hit with Thunderbolt. Also, I forgot to heal going into this fight, so that's just great. Raichu goes for Mega Punch, it does a bit of damage, I hit Body Slam doing more than half, and then Surge just uses an X Speed. So with that, I have defeated him in Pokemon Yellow as well, and we can compare some splits again. So Pokemon Yellow is still ahead, and it's actually gained a little bit of time. It's now ahead by 3 minutes and 46 seconds. Okay, so now let's talk about the Rock Tunnel Gauntlet. There are so many random NPCs here that can mess you up in a solo challenge. The first of them is the Wrapping Lass. Luckily today, in both versions, Kangaskhan is not going to have a problem because it can just one-hit all of her team members with Body Slam. Next, just inside the cave, is this Pokemaniac. He has a Cubone and a Slowpoke. He can be scary, but because I'm a normal type, I'm not worried. Next is the Status Condition Junior Trainer. Luckily, Body Slam gets one hits on both of her team members. And then for the Self Destructing Hiker, I have Bubble Beam, which can one shot all of his rock ground types. And with that, I have made it to the mid game in Pokemon Yellow. Now, because I anticipate that the late game threats are going to be much stronger in this game, I'm going to explore the Rocket Hideout to collect a lot of useful items. After all, in here I can pick up the TM for Double Edge, as well as a Rare Candy. By exploring this area and collecting items, I also have more money in the department store to purchase vitamins with. However, before that I'm going to grab the useful TMs at the top floor. I have a choice here of teaching either Ice Beam or Rock Slide or both of these moves, but because of the discrepancy between Kangaskhan's attack and special stats, I think I think that teaching Rock Slide makes sense, and I'll save Ice Beam for later. Okay, so now it's time for a major battle that is quite different between the two games. More so than any other battle up to this point in the run. The rival in Pokemon Tower is uh, quite bad in Yellow version, and I'm going to talk about him later when we get to the Red version's playthrough. In this case, I can one-shot the Furo with Rock Slide. After that, he has some weak Pokemon, a Magnemite, a Shelder, and a Sandshrew, all of which are easy to defeat in a single hit for Kangaskhan. Last is his starter, which hasn't evolved, it's just an Eevee, it has lower physical defense than it has special, and I'm able to one-shot it with Body Slam. Now luckily for Kangaskhan against Agatha Jr, I don't really have to worry, because I can just use Rock Slide to one-shot the Ghastly here. The only loss condition would be missing with Rock Slide, and then having things go out of control because of confusion, because the Ghastly can't affect me with Lick, so there's no chance to be paralyzed here. Overall. This fight is not going to be a problem for Kangaskhan in any game. At the top of the tower, Yellow Version only has to face Jesse and James, so that's a total of 3 Pokemon, and after defeating them, I'm level 32. Keep that in mind for later, when Red Version passes through this area. And now with this section of the game, I can head to Saffron City, defeat this rocket, and obtain the TM for Earthquake. Here, I really want to mention the combination of Body Slam, Earthquake, and Rock Slide. I can now hit every Pokemon in the game for at least neutral damage with a physical move that has a high base power. Of course, having to use Rock Slide against a Pokemon is the worst case scenario because it only has 75 base power and it has a 90% accuracy. Also in Generation 1, Rock Slide doesn't have a chance to flinch. That was added in Generation 2. Now I came to Sylph specifically so that I could get some vitamins as well as this powerful moveset upgrade 
upgrade, but I'm not going to stay here because the rival is quite challenging. Instead, I head through the Safari Zone, actually running into a Kangaskhan on my way, which is kind of cute. After obtaining Surf, which I'm not going to teach to Kangaskhan because there is no move deleter in Generation 1, I dig out, heading back to Celadon City, and now I'm going to head for Erika's Gym so that I can take on the Grass-type Specialist. She is probably one of the trainers that is most misunderstood between the two games. I think most people assume that she's easier in yellow version because she doesn't have a victory bell or a vile plume. However, in this game, all of her Pokemon are at higher levels, and as a result their stats are actually very similar to their red and blue counterparts. Also, the Tangela knows Mega Drain and Vine Whip, which it doesn't have in red and blue. For Kangaskhan, the best choice is to spam Body Slam the entire time. I don't know why I used Earthquake on the Weeping Bell. It survives. It probably wouldn't have if I used Body Slam. As a result, it gets to go for Razor Leaf, and here we see a difference between the games, because it doesn't crit. Whereas Victory Bell in red version is always going to crit with this move because of its base speed. After that, all that's left is Gloom. This thing is significantly worse than her Vile Plume in red and blue version. So despite my misplay, I'm able to take a first attempt victory here today in yellow version. The yellow Kangaskhan gets a 36 minute and 1 second Erika split. But how will Kangaskhan do in this section of the game in Pokemon Red? Well, everything leading up to the rival in Lavender Town is essentially identical. However, this fight is where things diverge. If the rival had chosen a different starter, at this point in the game he would have a Gyarados. However, going up against Wartortle, which I do think is going to be the hardest starter for the rival to have in the champion fight, his team isn't that difficult. He leads with Pidgeotto, which I can one-hit. Next is Growlithe, which is absolutely useless. I easily knock it out with Rock Slide. And then it's time for Execute. I'm lucky, Body Slam gets a one-hit here, Kadabra's next, I outspeed, knocking it out in a single hit, and all that's left is Wartortle. So while theoretically this fight is a little bit harder, the Pidgeotto can use Sand Attack, the Execute could use Hypnosis, the Kadabra and the Wartortle both have special moves, in practice Kangaskhan has an easy time in both games. And that leads us to the top of the tower. Now, while the mid-game in yellow might be harder, in red and blue, there are just more Pokemon that I have to make my way through. The first Rocket here has three Pokemon on his team, and the Golbat even survives a hit from Body Slam, so I should probably have used Rock Slide against it. After that, the second Rocket has two Pokemon on his team, and then the third Rocket has a total of four Pokemon. When we compare this with the Jesse and James battle in yellow version, it's quite clear that Kangaskhan is going to be losing some time here in red version. However, there is an advantage to this, because coming out of the tower I'm level 33, meaning I've gained slightly more experience in red version. I follow my yellow route next, grabbing the TM for Earthquake, and then I decide to take a different path. Rather than leaving Sylph and fighting Erika, I am going to go up against the rival here right away. This is specifically because the mid-game of Red and Blue is much easier than Yellow version, despite the fact that he does have an Alakazam on his team here, that's a little bit worrying. However, what I was thinking is that I can just use Rare Candies earlier on in this game and take an advantage by doing that. I make it through the Alakazam, making it to the Blastoise. This thing does not have particularly good moves. Its best move is Water Gun. My first Body Slam paralyzes it, so things are even better for me. Blastoise goes for Water Gun, taking me down to low orange health. I get another Body Slam in, taking it down to orange health. However, because of leech seed damage, its second water gun does too much and Kangaskhan faints. Okay, I wanted to try that fight at the lowest possible level. Now it's time to use some rare candies, so let's go all the way up to level 40. This trivializes the fight because now Kangaskhan moves first against the Alakazam and can simply one hit it. After that, I get lucky, crit the Blastoise, and knock it out in only two turns. So now, with Sylph taken care of, because obviously Giovanni is no problem, I'm gonna head to Fuchsia City to take on Koga next. This is an option in red version because his team is quite frankly trash. He has two coughing, a muck, and a wheezing. All of these Pokemon are mono poison types, so they take super effective damage from Earthquake. Additionally, there are no abilities in Generation 1, so they don't even have Levitate to avoid this move. And all of these Pokemon are quite slow, and that's usually the problem in yellow. You can't outspeed the Venomoth. As a result, I take a very easy victory over him, and with this badge, Kangaskhan gets a 12.5% boost to its speed stat. 
Okay, so now I'm going to backtrack and face Erica. I'm going to completely take away all of the tension here and just tell you that Kangaskhan is not going to have any problems. After all, I used rare candies, so I'm very overleveled. Instead, I just want to show her yellow team on the left-hand side of the screen so that we can compare the Pokemon's stats and movesets. Do remember that damage rounding is a thing because the level of the Pokemon is factored into the damage calculation, so the Pokemon in yellow will be over more damage rounding thresholds than the Pokemon in red and blue. As a result, having slightly lower stats in yellow version means that they'll probably do around the same amount of damage, with the notable exception of the Victory Bell, which is always going to crit with Razor Leaf. Alright, so with that battle out of the way in red and blue version, let's go back to yellow version, because now we need a comparable split to see how both Kangaskhans are doing throughout the mid-game. And that split is going to come after I defeat Koga, because first I have to face the rival in Sylph. Now for yellow version, I did decide that I was going to use rare candies here. After all, I think Kangaskhan is quite strong, and saving them for later might be overly conservative. Unfortunately, due to my moveset, I don't really have a good option against the Sand Slash. It's going to take three hits to knock out. Next is Cloyster. I have to use Rock Slide here, and it's going to be a two hit. So we sustain a decent amount of damage from Clamp, which hits for three turns. Earthquake obviously one hits the Magneton. Next is Kadabra. While this Pokemon is weaker in yellow version, it doesn't matter because Kangaskhan is faster. After that, all that's left is Flareon. However, I have Earthquake for it, so I take an easy first attempt victory. With Giovanni out of the way, I head to Koga's gym to face him. Okay, so Kangaskhan has enough speed to move first against the Venomoth, which is really convenient. Also, I have super effective damage in the form of Rock Slide, so I'm able to one-hit the first two Venonats. The third one does actually survive. Here I want to note that Koga's Ace Weezing is only level 43 in red version, whereas his Ace Venomoth in this game is level 40. 50. Also, for some reason, as the poison type gym leader, he knows the move Psychic, which just shreds so many Pokemon. However, in the case of Kangaskhan, I'm not really that worried about it, and I take a first attempt victory. So, comparing Pokemon Red's Erika split with Pokemon Yellow's Koga split, we can see that Yellow is still around three and a half minutes ahead. Despite the rapidly rising level curve in Yellow version, Kangaskhan just doesn't have a problem with any of these Pokemon. It has the moves, the bulk, and the typing that it needs to get through those battles. And as a result, the Pokemon Red Kangaskhan just hasn't really got an opportunity to catch up. However, what's immediately ahead for it could give it a chance, because Sabrina, Blaine, and Giovanni are all much easier in red and blue. However, you might protest at this idea and say, Sabrina has four Pokemon on her team in this game, and she also has good AI, but uh, her Alakazam is seven levels lower, and it doesn't know Psychic, which it does know in Yellow version. And there's no type effectiveness coming into play here because I'm a normal type. So in Red, Kangaskhan is just able to completely crush her team with Body Slam. After that, it's time for Blaine. He's probably the most notoriously bad gym leader in this game. Like, he has a Growlithe and a Ponyta on his team. Also, he loves using Super Potions when he's at full health, which is just terrible. Why did they not fix that in the code? That seems like the first thing that you would notice when testing these games and just go like, we need to make it so that he doesn't do that anymore. However, today, none of this is relevant because Kangaskhan has Earthquake, so he can just sweep through his entire team until the Arcanine, which actually does survive. However, it just goes for Roar, doing nothing, and then I finish it off on the next turn. So yeah, Blaine was completely free as well. However, of all of the gym leaders contrasted between red and blue, Giovanni is probably the biggest difference in difficulty. Like, his Nidos have Poison Sting. I guess that's the same type attack bonus move. The Nido Queen has Body Slam and the Nido King has Thrash, but like, what is Rhydon doing? Fissure and Horn Drill? with 53 speed. Yeah, those moves don't work if you aren't faster than your opponent. So I don't know what Giovanni's thinking, but uh, this Rhydon is clearly set up just to counter Slowpoke. Anyways, needless to say, Kangaskhan in red has no problems finishing him off. It's coming out of the gym challenge with a time of 48 minutes and 19 seconds. So now let's compare with Pokemon Yellow. First of all, we have to go up against Blaine. 
While his team is one member smaller, he has all fully evolved Pokemon, they have fantastic moves, they're at higher levels than in Red and Blue, and he also gets lucky right away by burning Kangaskhan on the first turn. Also, I should mention that he doesn't use Super Potions at full health anymore, so that is a nice fix. Now, when you're burned, your attack stat is cut in half, and this means I don't even do half damage to the Rapidash when I hit it with Earthquake. Then it further lowers my attack with a Growl, and here I basically thought that this was over. However, I do manage to knock the Rapidash out with my next hit, but what am I going to do against the Arcanine? Like, Yellow Version is definitely going to lose some time, uh, unless I get a critical hit right away and knock the Arcanine out in a single turn. Okay, so I guess Red Version is not catching up here. Well, what about Sabrina? The fact that her Alakazam is now level 50 instead of level 43 means that it has more speed than my Kangaskhan. I don't level up, so I don't get a chance to even speed tie it. However, Sabrina doesn't have good AI, and uh, even if she did, she would have no idea what to do here and just randomize her moves. Alakazam picks Recover at full health, which is kind of a Blaine move. Then my Body Slam connects, taking Alakazam down to red health but it causes paralysis, allowing me to move first on the next turn, and with that, I have defeated her. Okay, so another gym leader where red version is surprisingly not going to catch up. However, I think that Giovanni is going to have something to say about that. I just want to note here that Kangaskhan is going into this battle with 138 speed, which is enough to move first against all of his Pokemon, and I didn't have to use any rare candies to make that happen just before this fight like I typically do. I hit Dugtrio with Body Slam, knocking it out in one turn. Next is Persian, it just misses Fury Swipes and I take it out over two hits. Then it's time for the Nidoqueen. Now while it does take super effective damage from Earthquake, I only do half, and then it uses Double Kick, which gets a crit, doing more than half to me. However, because of the type effectiveness here, the Nidoking is also going to go for double kick, and if it doesn't crit, I am going to survive. Uh, also, if I crit, I'm just going to knock the Nidoking out right away and move on to the Rhydon. I have Bubble Beam. This thing is 5 levels higher than its red and blue counterpart, but that doesn't really help it. Bubble Beam does more than half, Giovanni just uses a guard spec, and with that I have defeated him. Okay, so comparing the Giovanni splits, Yellow Version is 3 minutes and 15 seconds ahead. So since Brock, Kangaskhan has been able to maintain its lead in what is typically the harder mid-game. However, in Yellow Version, the Elite Four is also known for their improved movesets, so I can see myself losing some time there. But before that, we're going to have to defeat the rival on Route 22. Honestly, I don't really know what to say about this fight. Like, Bubble Beam is terrible at this portion of the game, but... Yeah, I can just take the Sand Slash out, I take almost no damage. After that, the Execute is really weak. I do two hit the Cloister, but it just goes for Withdraw, dealing no damage to me. And after that, I can just sweep with Earthquake and Body Slam to take an easy win here. Now that might not be the case in Red version, just because his team is a little bit better, like the Alakazam and the Blastoise are definitely better, the Rhyhorn and the Growlithe are definitely worse, the Execute is basically the same, and the fact that he leads with Pidgeot is pretty bad. This thing has Whirlwind, which does nothing in trainer battles. Anyways, I just one-shot it with Rock Slide, Bubble Beam one-shots Rhyhorn, Earthquake one-shots Growlithe, Body Slam has to two-hit the Execute, which means it does get to set up Leech Seed, but I outspeed the Alakazam, so I don't take any damage here. All that's left is Blastoise. Body Slam's the most powerful move, plus it can cause Paralysis. Blastoise sets up Withdraw, so it's withstanding my hits a little bit better. However, it's just not doing that much damage until it chooses High Hydro Pump. This does so much to Kangaskhan, but with its high base HP stat, it hangs on, I hit one more body slam, and in red version I have also defeated the Route 22 rival on my first attempt. With that battle out of the way, now it's time for the Elite Four. Up first is Lorelei, and we're going to switch over to yellow version for this fight. You might have thought with Kangaskhan in these final rival fights that it was kind of weird that I was holding on to Bubble Beam. Why not use a move like Ice Beam, which is going to do more damage to Pokemon like the Sand Slash? The reason is, is that I had to teach Mimic in Bubble Beam's place, because I'm going to use this move for Lorelei. My goal here is to mimic Amnesia from the Slowbro, and then set it up so that I'm not taking very much damage from her Water or Ice type moves. However, things are not going well by the time I knock the Cloister out, I only have 21 hit points left over. So going for Mimic is just not going to work here. I hope for a crit on Body Slam, but I don't get it. Slowbro uses Surf, and that's a loss. 
All right, so there's an alternative strategy here. I can teach Thunderbolt in the place of Body Slam and Mimic in the place of Bubble Beam. This might seem weird because Kangaskhan has terrible special. I have 142 attack and after leveling up to level 50, only 84 special. However, Thunderbolt is quite good against the Cloister. It is better than Rock Slide, so I'm able to two hit it. This allows me to arrive at the Slowbro with green health. And from here, I can mimic Amnesia and set it up. This minimizes the damage that I take while I set up, and it also maximizes the damage that Thunderbolt eventually does when I strike back. I finish the Slowbro off in a single hit, Jinx goes down to a single Rock Slide, and I knock the Lapras out with one more Thunderbolt. And with that, we have arrived at the Hiker's Chamber, the trainer that very rarely causes resets. While Kangaskhan is a normal type, and he is a fighting type specialist, I don't expect much from him. On the Hitmonlee, I don't knock it out in a single hit, it goes for high jump kick, and does more than half. Alright, that's a little bit worrying, at least I one-shot the Onyx with Earthquake. Now, all that's left is Machamp, I go for Earthquake, it does about a third, then he uses an X-Defend, Machamp goes for Submission, uh, for once, and it knocks Kangaskhan out. Okay, but that's not going to happen the next time because I crit the Hitmonlee, knocking it out in a single hit, so it can't go for high jump kick. The Onyx survives my Earthquake, I guess I got a crit last time. He uses Screech, making my defense not very nice. I finish it off on the next turn, he sends in Machamp, it survives my Earthquake, goes for Submission, and because my lowered defense, it knocks Kangaskhan out. I just want to note here, I'm taking this seriously, like, I'm going into this battle at full health. I also used four rare candies before this battle to take me up to level 55 so that I would have the best damage ranges possible, and things are just not going well. In the third battle, the Hitmonchan Ice Punches me, which freezes Kangaskhan. Ah, <sighs> however... In this case, that is not an instant loss, because I can keep fishing for the Hitmonchan to use Fire Punch, and when it does, it defrosts me. I think this is the first time that I've showed footage like this on the channel. It is the second time it has ever happened to me, by the way. Still, it was able to chip away at me quite well. The Hitmonlee hits a Mega Kick, taking me down to red health, and I make it back to the Machamp, but I'm not very hopeful here. I go for Earthquake, get a critical hit, doing more than half. Bruno uses an X Defend. I get another Earthquake in and it doesn't get the knockout, Machamp uses strength, and Kangaskhan goes down for a third time. This is the worst time I have ever had against Bruno. I can't believe that I am struggling this much. However, in the next battle, the Machamp just goes for Leer first turn, and then Strength, which doesn't do that much, and I am able to finally finish it off. Yellow version has dropped a lot of time here. However, the next battle against Agatha is actually not going to be an issue at all. The ghosts don't have Levitate, so Earthquake in combination with Rock Slide, I have super effective damage for all of her Pokemon, and I sweep to a quick and easy victory. And that brings us to Lance. Here, I'm going to go for Thunderbolt against the Gyarados. I get a one hit because it's four times damage. After that, I've taught Ice Beam specifically for the Dragon types. However, it does just over half to the Dragonairs, which is not great. My second one crits, allowing me to knock it out in one turn. Next is Aerodactyl. I go for Rock Slide, taking it out over two turns. And now I've made it to the Dragonite. Obviously, Ice Beam does four times damage, but it doesn't get the KO. Okay, so I'm going to have to tank a Thunder. And in this case, Kangaskhan barely holds on, hits a second Ice Beam, and with that, I have defeated Lance. Now, let's see if the Pokemon Red Kangaskhan can catch up. Between the games, Lorelei have several notable changes. The Dugong has different AI in Pokemon Yellow. In Pokemon Red, it just has standard good AI. That doesn't affect Kangaskhan, though. Next is Cloyster. I get stuck in a clamp here, which is kind of annoying. By the way, this Pokemon is identical between the two games. And unfortunately for me, the clamps are just too bad today. They get a critical hit, and Kangaskhan goes down. So that's mirroring exactly what happened in Pokemon Yellow. I'm also going to switch to the strategy that I was using in Pokemon Yellow by teaching Kangaskhan Thunderbolt and then leveling up with some rare candies. However, here you'll note one difference, and that's the fact that I did not teach Mimic. Now, Lorelei's Slowbro knows Growl, Water Gun, Withdraw, and Amnesia, which is very different from Yellow version. Over there, Growl is replaced with Psychic, and Water Gun is replaced with Surf, so it has a much better moveset. That would allow me to more easily mimic Amnesia in this game, but I don't really think I need to do that, and as a result, I can keep Body Slam on my moveset, which is going to give me better damage in some of the following fights. I make it through her on my first attempt with Thunderbolt, and now I'm heading to Bruno. So for this fight, his uh, movesets are much worse than in Yellow version, like the first Onyx has Rock Throw, 
and Harden. Great moves. Also Rage. Then the Hitmonchan is almost the same. In this case, though, it has Counter, which can actually be bad in some cases. I go for Body Slam, which could have done a lot to me, but the Hitmonchan doesn't know what to do. It just uses Ice Punch, and I knock it out on the next turn. Body Slam 1 hits the Hitmonlee. The second Onyx has the exact same moveset as the first one, and then I make it to the Machamp. Now, while it does no submission in this game, it has a significantly worse moveset, knowing Focus Energy and Fissure, both moves that will do nothing to me. It just goes for Leer, and I knock it out with two Body Slams. So no resets on Bruno for Red version. Obviously, let's not waste any time with Agatha. She is an easy sweep with Earthquake, and that leads me to Lance in Pokemon Red. For this fight, I replace Body Slam with Ice Beam. It's not doing that much, but Lance's movesets are much worse. The Gyarados is identical. The first Dragonair in yellow version can paralyze you with Thunderbolt or Thunder Wave, whereas in this game, it just has Agility and Dragon Rage. In Pokemon Red and Blue, the two Dragonairs are actually identical. Then there's Aerodactyl, which does not know Fly or Wing Attack, so it's not very good. It does take me down to red health, but I finish it off on the next turn, and that leads to Lance's final Pokemon, Dragonite. Now it will KO me if it hits Hyper Beam or Slam, but it also has Agility and Barrier, and that doesn't even matter because I get a critical hit with Ice Beam and finish it off in one hit. So with that, both Kangaskhans are through the Elite Four. Coming out of the Lance split, Pokemon Yellow is still ahead. However, it dropped the majority of its time at Bruno, and it now only has a 32 second lead. In Pokemon Red, the champion is much easier. He leads with a Pidgeot, which has useless moves like Mirror Move and Whirlwind. Also, Sky Attack is just terrible. I have Rock Slide, I get a critical hit, and knock it out in one turn. Now the champion's Alakazam is almost identical between the two games. There is only one difference here, and that's in red version it has Reflect, and in yellow version it has Kinesis. I'm not able to finish it off in one hit with Earthquake. The champion uses a full restore, then I take it back down to red health, Alakazam uses Reflect, and I finish it off. So in yellow version that would have been a worse outcome because I would have had my accuracy lowered for the remaining four Pokemon. Up next is the champion's Rhydon, perhaps one of the worst AI Pokemon in the entire game. It has Horn Drill, which is going to do nothing because it has so low speed. And then it also has Tail Whip and Leer. Why does it have both of these moves? My theory is that in development, Tail Whip lowered defense by one stage, Leer lowered defense by two stages, and Screech lowered defense by three stages. And then I think that later on in development, they figured out that lowering defense by three stages was probably too much, and then they scaled these moves back. However, that just makes Rhydon have two of the exact same moves. So the only way I can deal damage is with Fury Attack, and, and yeah, it doesn't even do anything, so I just knock it out for free. Arcanine is next. This Pokemon is terrible. Roar does nothing in trainer battles. Ember is its best fire type move. Leer is once again pretty useless at this portion of the game. And Takedown is, I guess, decent because Arcanine has good attack. I finished off with Earthquake, move on to Executor. It's almost the same as in Pokemon Yellow. However, the fact that it comes earlier in the battle in Pokemon Yellow makes it stronger. And it also knows Leech Seed in that game, which is the primary reason that it is annoying. I finish it off today, move on to Blastoise, it misses Blizzard, I hit my second Thunderbolt, then it hits Hydro Pump, and knocks Kangaskhan out. Okay, so it looks like his team is trivial until I get to the Blastoise. It finishes me off a second time with Blizzard, and now I want to draw your attention to the fact that I have changed my moveset. I'm using Blizzard instead of Ice Beam. This just gives me slightly more damage against the Rhydon as well as against the Executor, so that hopefully I make it to the Blastoise with more health. This time, I get there with green health, and now I can use three Thunderbolts to knock his final Pokemon out and clock in with a final time of 58 minutes and 46 seconds, with seven resets at level 58. This took three hours and 35 minutes of game time. All right, so I hope that I made the case that the Pokemon Yellow Champion is more difficult than the Pokemon Red and Blue Champion. One reason he's usually more difficult is the leading Sand Slash, but that's not really a challenge today because I just freeze it and knock it out with two Ice Beams. Next is Alakazam. I get a critical hit here, knocking it out in a single turn, and then it's time to face the earlier Executor. Unfortunately, it goes for Hypnosis right away. I do not wake up quickly, and as a result, it chips me all the way down to red health, I get one more Ice Beam in, but it finishes me off with its next Barrage. 
Okay, so that's one reset, but it came earlier in the fight than it did in red version. In the next battle, once again, I get put to sleep by the Executor and chipped away at by Barrage. And this time I don't even wake up and it finishes me off for a second time. However, when I wake up early on from the Hypnosis, I am able to finish it off and move on to the Magneton for the first time. Here, I can use Earthquake to get the one shot. Next is Cloyster. It looks like I'm going to two hit with Thunderbolt, but because Leech Seed heals it slightly, I don't get the KO on the next turn and it chips away at me with Spike Cannon before I finally take it down with my third Thunderbolt. I level up to level 60, and now it's time for his last Pokemon, Flareon. It's not nearly as good as his Blastoise for a final Pokemon, but up until this point in the fight, there are just many more threats. So here, Kangaskhan is able to use Earthquake and knock it out in a single hit, clocking in with a final time of 58 minutes and 20 seconds with 8 resets at level 60. This took 3 hours and 24 minutes of game time. Alright, so I am actually quite surprised by these results. I did not expect Bruno in yellow version to be so difficult in uh, any playthrough, let alone in the Kangaskhan playthrough. Overall, I was able to finish the game in Pokemon Yellow 26 seconds faster than I was in Pokemon Red, so these are very close results. In Pokemon Yellow, I had one more reset, and I finished the game two levels higher. Mirroring my faster real-time result, I also had a faster game-time result by a shocking 11 minutes. Overall, I am most frustrated with Bruno in Yellow version. However, outside of that, I think that this is going to be a very easy playthrough to optimize. So now, let's do that in a second playthrough. The first question is what level is best to face Brock at in each game? For yellow version, I tested levels ranging from 10 to 15 for consistency, and in the end, I found that level 13 was best. So that's the same level that I used in my first playthrough. However, last time I had two resets against him, so without those, I am significantly faster this time in Pokemon Yellow. And that has the potential to put a little bit more pressure on Pokemon Red. After all, in this game, Brock's Pokemon are two levels higher. I came into this fight at level 15, even though my testing showed me that I could beat Brock at level 13 with Kangaskhan in red version, however the likelihood of that being the outcome in the first battle is quite low, so I wanted to play safely here. And you're probably going to see why, because against the Onyx, it unleashes energy and takes Kangaskhan all the way down to one hit point, and I just barely finish him off. Now from here I want to mention overall that Kangaskhan plays very similarly in both games. As we saw before, Pokemon Yellow is typically more difficult during the mid-game, however Kangaskhan has enough attack, speed, and the right moves to get through this section of the game without too many difficulties. However, there are some early threats, and the first one is Misty. In Pokemon Red, I am going up against her at level 19. To be this level, I had to do some extra training in Mount Moon, but I didn't do enough to get to level 20 before her. The consequence here is that I don't have a guaranteed one hit on her first Staryu, I only have a 77% chance to knock it out. Also, on the Starmie, I only have a 33% chance to knock it out in two hits. That's assuming that she doesn't use an X Defend or a Harden. And unfortunately for me, this leads to one reset here before I take her out on my second attempt. Now I did lose that fight because Misty got a critical hit with Bubble Beam. And uh, you know what you don't expect? Surge to win in red version, but he wins because his Raichu gets a critical hit with Thunderbolt. So that is another frustrating reset early on for Pokemon Red. However, from here, things get significantly easier. In Celadon City, I skip the hideout and buy myself two protein to improve my attack. After that, I am going to quickly go through my mid-game routing. So first I go to Pokemon Tower, then the Safari Zone, and after that I backtrack to Sylph. Here I fight some additional rockets to take Kangaskhan up to level 36, and after that I use four rare candies going up to level 40 before the rival here. I'm quite confident going into this fight at this level, and I take a first attempt victory. After that I head to Koga, he is easy to defeat, then I backtrack to Erika, finishing her her off. After that I take care of Sabrina. Doing things in this order guarantees that I'm going to get one hits against all of her Pokemon as well as outspeeds against all of her Pokemon. With all that completed I one shot my way through all of Blaine's first three Pokemon and then I expect to two hit the Arcanine but in this case I get a critical hit knocking it out in one turn. Giovanni is essentially free, and with him out of the way, I have made it back to the rival on Route 22. Now while Kangaskhan outspeeds all of his team members here, there is a little bit of risk, like not from the first five Pokemon, but from the Blastoise specifically because it does no Hydro Pump. Now I kid you not, this risk is quite low because first of all Blastoise has to choose Hydro Pump, which is a 1 in 4 chance. 
and then it has to get a critical hit in order to knock me out. But in this case, it does get that, so that's a reset. It's a really annoying one as well, because the rival's whole team is easy for Kangaskhan to manage until his final Pokemon, and then the Blastoise causes issues. In the next battle, I have to talk about a second way that you can lose this fight, and that is that the Execute chooses Stun Spore against you, and then the Alakazam and the Blastoise can both deal damage to you. However, this isn't worth resetting right away, because you can play this fight out and still get a win, which is what happens here. Previously, I went into the Lorelei fight at level 53, but this time I want to go over one more damage rounding threshold to level 55. I defeat two Venomoths, these uh, powerful fighting type Pokemon in Victory Road, leveling Kangaskhan up to level 50, and then I can use five rare candies to take me all the way up to level 55. This choice doesn't have a major impact on this battle specifically, it just gives me slightly more HP as well as defensive stats so that I take less damage. Overall here, Kangaskhan just has a quite easy time against her and I beat her on my first attempt. After that, Bruno and Agatha are incredibly easy for red version, so that brings us to Lance. Now here I make a subtle moveset change, which you might have already noticed, which is going to make the champion easier. Instead of keeping Earthquake as my primary physical move, I'm going to keep Body Slam. After all, Earthquake is quite trash against all of Lance's Pokemon, so I would rather have Blizzard. Funnily enough here, even with 4 times damage from Thunderbolt and super effective damage from Blizzard, I do not have guaranteed 1 hits on any of Lance's team. All of them are 2 hits. By the way, I did compare the damage and see if Rock Slide would be doing more damage against most of these Pokemon, and unfortunately for me, even though Kangaskhan has more attack, Rock Slide is just not the better choice. For example, against the Gyarados, the Rock Slide does between 58% damage and 68% damage, whereas Thunderbolt does between 65% damage and 77% damage. The only case where that isn't true is against the Aerodactyl, however, because Rock Slide does not have a chance to flinch, it still makes more sense to go for either Thunderbolt or Blizzard in the off chance that it causes a status condition. Either way, this fight's quite straightforward because they can't hit me for very much damage, so I win on my first attempt. And that brings Pokemon Red all the way back to the champion. Here I'm going to use Blizzard to two-shot the Pidgeot. I need to do this. If I use Thunderbolt, it will be a three hit, which I just don't want to do. After that, because I'm using Body Slam instead of Earthquake, I can one-shot the Alakazam consistently. Then I can use Blizzard to knock out the Rhydon and Body Slam to two-hit the Arcanine. Yes, it would be better to have Earthquake here, but uh... No, Arcanine is not a threat, so I don't need to worry about it. And now we're at the part of the fight where there is not a good solution. Despite Blizzard being super effective against the Executor, it is not the best choice. Body Slam actually has a 32% chance to two hit, and it also has a 30% chance to paralyze, so that's why I'm using it. The ideal play here would be to get the two hit and also get the paralysis on the first turn, preventing it from moving and not getting put to sleep. Still, it can just choose Barrage or Stomp, so I finish it off and move on to the Blastoise. What I'm really banking on here is it using a bad move like Bite or Withdraw at least once. Because I'm a normal type, it's going to randomize its move selection, so I think that that's at least fairly lucky. In this case, it goes for Withdraw on turn 1, then it goes for Blizzard, Kangaskhan just barely survives on 4 hit points, and with that, I have finished Pokemon Red for a second time. In this attempt, I get a better time of 55 minutes and 32 seconds, with only 3 resets, and I finish the game at level 61. This took 3 hours and 36 minutes of game time. Honestly, this is a pretty moderate improvement over my former playthroughs results, so I wasn't particularly happy with my performance. However, let's see if Pokemon Yellow can keep pace. And here we're going to jump straight to the rival in Sylph. At this point, I should just mention how similarly Kangaskhan plays in these two games. Like, I am doing the exact same route that I had in Pokemon Red. So really, all that's different is how the battles play out. I take a first attempt victory over the rival in Sylph. Then I have a minor difference between the two routes. I face Erika first before I face Koga. Unfortunately for me, I do not have guaranteed one hits on all of his Venonats. The first one is always going to be a one hit. The second one is a 68% chance to knock out, and the third one is a 32% chance to knock out. As a result, I get poisoned on the second one, and then the third one hits Psychic, doing about a quarter. After that, I get to the Venomoth, and here Rock Slide is going to be a two hit. And unfortunately for me, Venomoth gets a critical hit with Psychic, taking me down to three hit points. And then Rock Slide misses, causing me to lose to poison damage. 
So I hope that you can see there that that was a very unlikely outcome. It's sort of like the resets that I got against Misty and Surge in the early game with Pokemon Red. On my next attempt, I easily defeat him. From there, we're going to fast forward directly into the fight against Lorelei. Once again, I am taking the same approach as Pokemon Red, so I have arrived here at level 55. And in this case, I was trying to play this fight identically, keeping Body Slam for later in the league. However, in Pokemon Yellow, that is much riskier because the Slowbro is so much stronger. Because it has access to Psychic and Surf, it can deal a lot of damage before it goes down, and in this case I have only one HP left over for the rest of the battle. Unfortunately for me, even if I crit the Lapras, it will not go down in a single hit, so what I needed to do is either miss or use Confuse Ray, and then get a critical hit on the second turn. This doesn't play out, so I have one reset here. However, it's worth noting that since I'm using Body Slam, things can play out very differently. I can paralyze the Slowbro right away, it can miss its attacks, I finish it off, finish the Jinx off, and arrive at the Lapras with full health. Then I get a single crit against it, allowing me to two hit, and with that I'm moving on to, uh, to Bruno. We're back here for a second time. I hope that it goes better. And in this case, luckily for me, it is going to go much better. So I'll take this time while I'm beating him to just explain how I tested this fight. I came back in and I did my old school method. I sat down and I said, I'm gonna beat Bruno with Kangaskhan 10 times in a row, and hopefully I will defeat him every single time. And guess what happened? I, uh, I beat him every single time. So I don't know what was happening in the previous playthrough. I just got really unlucky. The fact that Bruno does not have good AI makes him so bad. Seriously, if they had just given him good AI, he would actually be a threat in Pokemon Yellow for so many normal types. However, since the Machamp doesn't know what to do, it just goes for Karate Chop, doing very little, and I finish it off with two hits. So Lance is up next, and my strategy here is identical to Pokemon Red. Unfortunately for me, Lance gets really lucky and gets a critical hit with Hyper Beam right away from the Gyarados, so I do have one reset here. And even when Lance doesn't get lucky, this fight is still risky because of his improved movesets in Pokemon Pokemon Yellow. His Pokemon just deal way more damage throughout the fight, and as a result I have a second reset. It was at this point that I realized that I can't really play the league in Pokemon Yellow identically to Pokemon Red and Blue. So I teach Rest, and this just gives me a little bit more flexibility against Lance, and with it I am able to take the victory. However, having to teach Rest isn't the worst case scenario because it's pretty useful against the champion. In this case I make it to the Flareon with red health, and then I can use Rest to heal up and knock it out eventually. So Pokemon Yellow clocks in with a time of 50 minutes and 36 seconds, with 5 resets at level 60. This took 3 hours and 10 minutes of game time. Honestly, I did not expect there to be a 5 minute difference between these two games. I really anticipated that the mid game, even with extreme blunders in the late game of Pokemon Yellow, I was able to get a really good time. However, I was left unsatisfied by these second playthrough results. So of course, I did another playthrough. Going into this, I knew that I would not be able to match Pokemon Yellow's performance if in Pokemon Red I went into the Brock fight at level 15. So I'm going to go for the more risky option and head into this fight at level 13. By doing this, I am able to achieve a split of 7 minutes and 37 seconds, which is by far my best Brock split in Pokemon Red. However, if Pokemon Yellow just plays conservatively and goes into the Brock fight at level 13, I am able to defeat him with a better time of 6 minutes and 57 seconds. However, the lead in the first playthrough was 3 minutes and 37 seconds, so 40 seconds is significantly different. Now for Pokemon Red, I'm just going to mention a couple of things in Mount Moon which are small improvements that I made for this playthrough. So I'm going to fight some optional trainers just so I'm level 18 right before the junior trainer in Misty's gym. This way I can use both rare candies accumulated to this point in the playthrough to take Kangaskhan up to level 20. This has a significant impact on the Misty fight because now Mega Punch has a guaranteed one hit. Also this level gives an 84% chance to two hit the Starmie and I get it in this case case because I got a lucky crit on the first turn, and that allows Kangaskhan to proceed past the second gym leader in red version without a reset. And this time, Surge goes according to plan, so I don't have a reset here either. 
So now let's skip ahead to the mid game and you are probably wondering, Scott, why are you in the rocket hideout? Doesn't it just make sense to skip this area? And that's what I was thinking in my initial two playthroughs. However, doing this area gives me access to so many items that I can sell, and this will allow me to buy five protein once I get to the department store, really improving my damage ranges throughout the rest of the playthrough. This is going to allow me to skip some training later on because I have one more candy. I still go up to level 36 before the rival in Sylph and then take a quick victory over him. Now a large portion of this mid to late game is very easy for Kangaskhan as we've seen before, so let's skip ahead now to Lorelei, and here you'll notice that my Kangaskhan is level 57 because of these small tweaks that I've made to this point. So I arrive at Lorelei's Lapras, use Rock Slide doing half, it's going to two hit by the way, and then I get frozen by Blizzard. So that's a really unfortunate first reset for this playthrough. I managed to defeat her on my second attempt, and with that I make it all the way to Lance. For this battle, I am going to take the learn set that I used in Pokemon Yellow, because I believe it will add more consistency here as well in Pokemon Red, just in case anything goes wrong. And in this case, I almost needed to use Rest at the very end of the battle. I do survive Dragonite Slam and then finish it off, though. Alright, so will Kangaskhan in Red version have a reset on the champion? And the answer is no. He's quite easy. I make it to the Blastoise. I am a slightly higher level. I tank its Hydro Pump very well and finish it off. So, in my third playthrough of Pokemon Red with Kangaskhan, I clock in with a time of 50 minutes and 34 seconds, with one reset at level 62. This took 3 hours and 19 minutes of game time. Now for Pokemon Yellow, I mirror exactly this approach throughout the mid-game. It's basically just the case that all the enemies are stronger, but it doesn't matter, because Kangaskhan is absolutely fantastic. And then on Lorelei, her Cloyster uses Supersonic, I hit myself, it uses Ice Beam, and yep, it freezes Kangaskhan. So just like Pokemon Red, my first reset is here. However, then at Lance for Pokemon Yellow, I actually decided to go with a completely different strategy. It's kind of weird that these two runs switched places. In this case, I am not even going to use Blizzard. I want to keep Earthquake because it's quite good against the champion. Instead, with Rest and Body Slam, I can basically just two-hit my way through his entire team. It's not very hard. There's nothing really standing in my way. After all, I can always heal if I need to, but in this case, because the Dragonite used Hyper Beam, I don't have to heal, so I just finish it off. Last is the champion, and unsurprisingly, Kangaskhan is able to make it through this fight without a reset. And in yellow version, it clocks in with a time of 47 minutes and 35 seconds. With one reset at level 62, this took 3 hours and 7 minutes of game time. So putting the results from this final playthrough side by side, I think it is quite clear that Pokemon Yellow is easier for Kangaskhan. I honestly had to sit with these results and let them sink in for a little bit. If we look at the differences between the splits, we can see that Pokemon Yellow had an advantage the entire time. It just slowly got bigger and bigger. I think a few factors make things play out this way. In Pokemon Red, there are a few extra trainers that have to be faced, like at the top of Pokemon Tower. Also, I generally have more experience with Pokemon Yellow, which I'm sure has led to like maybe 10 to 30 seconds of time accumulating in Pokemon Red. After all, these games are pretty similar, so I don't think I'm performing that badly in Red version. Finally, in Red, there are just a few key fights where things take a bit longer, specifically every time you go up against the rival. In Pokemon Yellow, that fight is much easier. So now it's time to officially re-rank Kangaskhan in my Pokemon Yellow tier list, and today with its 47 minute and 35 second time, it earns a spot just behind Hypno and just in front of Poliwrath in the A tier. By the way, you might be wondering, what about a Pokemon Red tier list? And yes, I am going to start doing a Pokemon Red tier list. However, I don't think we have quite enough results yet to kick it off. After all, I've only done playthroughs with Gyarados, Gengar, and Kangaskhan to this point. So maybe once we've collected like five or more playthroughs, I will start showing that tier list at the ends of videos. Up next in this series, I want to complete all of the remaining trade evolutions, so Alakazam, Machamp, and Golem. So stay tuned for those videos coming to the channel later on in the year. Like, subscribe, ring the Chimeco, and comment because I gotta read them all. If you support me through Patreon or YouTube memberships, thank you so much. It means the world to me. There are a lot of you now. I really appreciate the support, and I really appreciate all of the gifted memberships that have been coming in during my streams. By the way, I just want to make a few clarifications about the type of content that you'll see on this channel. Every weekend on Saturday, there will be one fully produced video, which will be somewhere around 35 minutes all the way up to an hour and a half. This is the kind of content that I uh, hope you have come to know and love, 
and I don't anticipate stopping making it anytime soon. So at least one video like that every week. Beyond that, I am trying to stream at least once a week right now. Those are probably going to be sometime midweek, at least for the near future on Thursdays. In those streams, you will see me attempt the game, usually two times with a particular Pokemon, with an intervening section where I try to optimize the Pokemon, and you can help me out during that process if you have ideas about how that Pokemon should be played best. After these streams, I'll be cutting the footage altogether and maybe doing some extra voiceover in post so that it becomes a video that is similar to my regularly produced videos, but not quite as high quality. And that shorter video, which will be somewhere between like 20 minutes to 40 minutes, will then be available on the channel if you don't want to sit through like a four to six hour stream. Overall, I really just want to get more choice out there for everyone, so if you want to watch a stream, you can. Some people have expressed a worry that my streams will become unlisted if I am making these stream highlights, and that's not going to be the case. I'm going to leave the stream VODs up indefinitely, just so that you can watch whichever type of content is most interesting to you. My main thinking around all of this is to just give all of you more content to enjoy. I hope you're excited about this, because I really am. Now, if you made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.